Church launches school ad with transgender Jesus sporting female breasts. Maybe they should just bring in those kindergarten teaching drag queens to teach this particular catechism. I'm Dr. Duke, she's Katie, and this is The Dr. Duke Show. Hello everyone and welcome to The Dr. Duke Show, the only program that keeps you educated on the craziness impacting K-12 classrooms and college campuses around the world. Today, we start with wokeness taking over the church as a new ad features Jesus Christ with a 34 C cup dancing around and prancing in the name of diversity. Yes, you heard me correctly. I, I may have to ask Katie for correctivity on the cup size, but take a look at the picture. Ladies, you let us know. What cup is Jesus sporting? in this particular picture for a Sunday school, advertising Sunday school. And it's not just that they affixed breasts to Jesus. They've got him cavorting. Why did they queered him up? Look, he, he's doing some kind of weird rainbow dance. So I love the uh, designer sandals that go all the way up to the top of the thigh muscle. I love the, uh, uh, the way the skirt dances in the wind. I love he's wearing rouge, yes? Jesus is wearing rouge. You're, at, you're trying to advertise kids to come in for catechism on Sunday school. And so you've decided that queering, not just embreastifying Jesus, you're going to queer him up, and that's going to make kids at, you know, 7, 9, 11-year-olds. This is, this is an appeal to them, right? Because you got 8-year-olds thinking about this. A guy with creepy sandals, rouge, and a bad beard, and boobs is something that you want to rally around behind and, and, and join the Catholic, the Christian church. It's pretty bizarre. Well, this is coming out of the Church of Iceland, if mm. that makes any sort of a difference to anyone. And the church's media representative defended, of course, this of course advertisement. Uh, Peter, is it Georg Markin, or it would it be George? Pita. Either George. way, it's Pita. I'm going to say Georg Markin. Uh, he said it supports diversity and suggests right. that having Jesus depicted in different ways is positive. Positive. You know what else supports diversity? Not showing Christianity. Yeah, there it is. Just, why don't you just make your not Christian church not Christian? Yes. In, in, the, in his actual quote, he says, In this advert, we see a Jesus who has breasts and a beard. We're trying to embrace society as it is. I don't know what's going on in yeah, Iceland. I remember, the message, <laughs> I remember the message of Jesus Christ in the Gospels mm. was to be very worldly, yeah. <laughs> was to reject the otherworldly, reject the time-honored truths of God the Father. You know, uh, he made the male and female. Uh, Jesus' entire message, wasn't it? As he yes. was cavorting around Jerusalem in the first sentence, for, uh, first century, uh, doing the Salome dance of veils. Remember that one? <laughs> remember in, in Matthew, I believe it was four, where Jesus puts on women's clothes and dances for Herod. Remember that? Was it Matthew 5? Matthew. There's 5. Mia culpa, mia culpa, Sorry. mia maxima culpa. Matthew 5. That's remember him cavorting around in ladies' clothes? Because I, I do remember from the Gospels, the primary message is that the purpose of Christianity is to be as worldly as possible at the minute possible that it's being discussed. Yes, well, according to Pita, he says, we have all sorts of people. In, again, Iceland, population eight people. I don't know. And we need to train ourselves to talk about Jesus as being all sorts, in mm. quotes, all sorts in this context. Right. Especially because it's really important that each and every person sees, see themselves in Jesus and that we don't stagnate too much. Yeah. That's see, the essential message. That's the message of Christianity. That's the essential Guys, message. it's 2,000 years old, man. Can we get a shot of Jesus in bed, one of them Sex in the City close-up shots of <laughs> Jesus in bed with a couple of women? Because there are a lot of polyamory couples out there that would, would recognize Jesus do, having two women, naked women, in bed with him. we got to reach out and not stagnate. All of this male, female, all of this heterosexuality, all of this, there's a God in heaven, really offends the atheists, too, and the Satanists. So we've got to make sure that our Jesus represents the times. And show the picture again, Mike. This is what, in Iceland, they think, well, I don't know what's even more annoying. The fact that they did this to Jesus, is he farting butterflies, by the way? Seriously, look no, at the bottom back. Look at how the back of the skirt is up. And you got like, that little wind, the little gesture, the little wind. And then you got these little pink butter. He is literally farting butterflies. This is their view of Jesus in Iceland that they think is actually going to be more alluring to kids. Well, see, now that's the benefit of this image, according to church minister Gjorn Karls Og Helgedata. He says, uh, he defended the advert, saying that each person interprets something in this picture. And oh, you, yeah? that's what you interpreted. That's, so, so everyone interprets something. Some people interpret it as a trans Jesus. 
others as a woman. Some see Mary with a beard, and others see a gender queer person. Who? Views within the church are just as diverse as elsewhere. You, I will give you everything I own, which isn't much. If you can find me one exactly. person they ran that by who said, hmm, that looks like Mary with a beard. It doesn't happen. What you're doing is you're taking your woke, liberal, theological seminary education, and you're assuming, you, you literally are caricaturing what you think progressive Christians are. You're the ones with the problem. You're the one. This is how you see Jesus. And if that's how you see Jesus, then you're not reading the same gospels the rest of us are. Don't give me this idea that you could hone the gospels and, and listen to the words of Christ, read the words of Christ in the King James Version and come to this view of Jesus. It's just not possible. Well, you're on the side with that other group of actual Christians who were concerned about this image. And so the church did decide to delete the advertisement and issued a statement saying that the assembly regrets that the picture of Jesus in a Sunday school advertisement has hurt people. The goal was to emphasize diversity, not to hurt people or shock them. However, the guy from before, Mr. Markin, said, uh, he's the media rep guy, he indicated that this would not, not be the end of the church using Christ's likeness to advance woke political topics. Listen to what they're telling you. The purpose of the church is to wake people up to modern political lenses. That's all it is. This is you can do this a thousand ways without pretending to be a church. Stop pretending to be a church. First of all, pastor, you got to fire your woke marketing director. He is not interested in promoting Christian values. He is inter interested in undermining them. And, and he just told you, you may be the pastor, but this isn't the last time you're going to see us. He, he used the own words. We're going to appropriate the image of Christ for our own worldly purposes. I Again, I go back to the Gospels. I understand the Gospels. That seems to be the exact opposite of what Jesus was saying. The eternal truths of God are truth. He kept pointing backward, not forward, to God the Father. He kept pointing out how I come from the Father to make you know, make known the will of the Father. And none of it had anything to do, my friends, with living in the world, adapting to the world, taking our, our theological and metaphysical message and conforming it to the ways of the world. It is everything Christ rejected. All of it, all the time. I mean, how is this? I, I get on the scale, Nazi comparisons are bad things. But in the, uh, the or 1930s, when the Nazi party was trying to co-opt Christ as somebody who would have been sympathetic for their pr weird particular worldview, and the Nazis came back to you and said, hey, we're just doing this to try to make Jesus more contemporary. We're just trying to show you how that there are brown-shirted thugs around here who identify to a Jesus who's burning down buildings. Okie dokie. Uh, moving on, we're going to talk about Jack Denton. And we've talked about Mr. Jack Denton before. He's a college student. And he's actually the former student senate president at the Florida State University. And most importantly, he's a Catholic. And that's what the whole point of this next story is, which we've talked about before. Um, we covered his story because he actually was ousted as being the student senate president after he made some comments on a private group chat, as we all do now on social media and get caught for something. And then he was forced to basically defend his Catholic faith. And for being Catholic, he got ousted as being the student senate president. And so this had happened already last last school year and then now he basically wrote his side of the story for the daily wire and explained what happened and now there's a lawsuit involved well good this is what happens iceland when you do notice what happens in iceland where they they queer up jesus in the name of tolerance and inclusivity and here you got somebody who actually is a supporter of jesus actually considers his roman catholic faith to be serious serious enough that he makes it part of his personal platform as a student government official and for that he is persecuted for being somebody who adheres to the gospel of christ in, in, a, in the, sac in the uh, secular universities, the hostile, anti-theistic secular universities. And so on the one hand, you've got Iceland, right, who's turned Jesus into a cartoon character, a, a blue, a great blue cartoon character, in order to attract non-Christians to take Christianity seriously, to, to try to get voices in the church who don't like Christianity. I don't know. But here you have a situation where an actual Christian kid is persecuted. And w where is Pastor George? Where are the, the Icelandics to condemn this kind of stereotyping, uh, this, this kind of attack on traditional Christianity. Again, we're living through the Amy, uh, Amy Coney Barrett. 
uh, nominations, where they're already going after her for the tragic sin of, ha- of being a devout Catholic, a traditional Catholic. They use the word traditional Catholic, mm. right? It, orthodox. It. They or- did ask, orthodox, say orthodox. Traditional she Catholic. She was questioned on that. In orthodox. other words, yeah. right, she's, a, she's not even a modern Catholic, 70% of which vote for abortion-killing Democrats. They're called Episcopalians. <laughs> yeah, may as well be. Catholic Church of Light. England, absolutely. It's a good Robin Williams joke. Anywho, back to <laughs> what's going on here with Mr. Denton. So he wrote this story. He gave his side of what actually happened, and he filed a lawsuit with the school. And the lawsuit is with help from the Alliance for Defending Freedom, and he's suing the university's leadership, and it's kind of fascinating to me. He's suing the president, John Thrasher, uh, the president of the Student Senate, who is uh, named Ahmed Deraldick. Or Duraldic. It's kind of interesting because he has his own controversy. So, a little side story. Denton got ousted. They put this Ahmed kid in, and they found out this Ahmed kid has a ton of anti Semitism on his social media dating back to 2013. But they didn't remove him. But they didn't remove him. So, he's right. named then in this lawsuit, as well as Alexander Harmon, who's the president pro temp of the Student Senate of the Florida State University. So, Mr. Denton is putting this lawsuit forth, and among the assertions in the suit, Uh, in the suit, it says, the Student Senate at Florida State University has failed its pedagogical purpose and it breached its constitutional obligations by removing its presiding officer, Jack Denton, in retaliation for his private religious speech. Right, his private religious speech that didn't hate anybody, that adhered to traditional Catholicism, dangerously pro-life, right? And meanwhile, Florida State University's news, the news, wrote that Senator Denton was not exiled from SGA, the Student Government Association, for his Catholicism. He was hardly exiled at all, merely stripped of his presidential title. Senator Denton was removed from his leadership position because his remarks while in office directly challenged the mission of the Student Government Association. Denton was unfit to preside over the Student Ah. Senate of Florida State University because his words defy the students of color, queer students, and transgender students that he he was elected to represent. Right, so he wasn't elected to represent represent traditional kids, heterosexual kids, Catholic kids, Christian kids. No, no, no. He was elected to rep exclusively kids who don't like what you stand for. And so who did they put in his place? Clearly, Ahmed. somebody with an Islamic backward ground. We, Ahmed, Ahmed, we assume, who has virulently anti That would also fit the Islamic profile, mm-hmm. right? Virulently anti-Semitic speech. But notice, notice, queer, LGTB, black and brown skin people aren't Jews. So Hmm. if you offend Jewish people, you can be Ahmed and you get to be the president and you haven't failed your duty to serve anybody. But the Catholic guy who believes in Catholic theology, who has, it's he who has betrayed gays, lesbians, transgenders, black and brown skinned people. The whole purpose of student government is to help gay, lesbian, black and brown skinned students and nothing else. And if you try to do anything else with that, well, I guess we're going to remove you. But Ahmed lives on. Yes. Mr. Denton uh, wrote in his story when he explained about the comments he made concerning Black Lives Matter and the ACLU. He said, I decided to politely point out my concerns to my classmates in the Catholic group me chat. I realize that our nation is wrestling with very challenging issues on race right now, and the solutions to those issues are complex and unclear. But what remains clear is the objective harm caused by supporting pro-abortion and anti-family organizations, including BlackLivesMatter.com and the ACLU. I had no intention of creating anger or division. I just want to make sure my friends were not unknowingly supporting organizations that are hostile to some of the core tenets of our faith. Again, private group. He says, I was making a point I thought all Catholics could agree upon. Mr. Denton. Sadly... I found out that not everyone did agree. M- Mr. Denton, stop, stop apologizing. Play offense, for God's sake. You were removed because of your faith. And they replaced you as somebody who's made shockingly racist statements while getting rid of you because you're a Catholic. Stop apologizing. Stop rationalizing. Stop qualifying. You did nothing wrong. And you filed a lawsuit. Stop acting as if you have to explain yourself. Make them explain themselves. Hint. When you try to explain what you were doing, everybody gets it. They haven't even tried. Let's hear the explanation why anti-Semite Al- um, Ahmed is a more worthy candidate than you. Shh, let them explain it. As per usual, when Campus Reform does one of their fun little videos, man on the street or woman on the street in this instance, type videos, the students, the, the ones being interviewed are just shocked, simply shocked to find out things. And this time they were shocked, I say. They were shooketh, if you will, to find out that a racist quote was said by Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood. First, 
Let's talk about Ophelia Jacobson, who is with Campus Reform. She's the one who decided to head to the University of Florida. So we're going from Florida State to University of Florida. And she decided to ask the kiddos on her campus about Planned Parenthood. And then they learned about the racist that is uh, Margaret Sanger. But first, the students were asked whether they support removing America's racist institutions and statues and figures and all of that. So over the last few weeks in this country, we've seen a movement to remove racist historical figures, institutions, and statues. Do you agree with this movement? Should we be doing that? Yeah, I completely agree with removing Confederate statues and any racist landmarks if they have a negative history. America has like a really toxic past and we shouldn't be like uh, memorializing that. Um, I think it's good. I think as a country we need to progress past like idolizing racist figures. Yeah, and I mean, it's an embarrassment. When you see these, Ed, Eduardo Nair does the same thing. First of all, they're almost dominated by female students. Yeah, I don't know I don't know if the men true. don't talk, but, but campuses have become such feminist places. I mean, I saw a statistic that almost, for every three, almost every three boys that go to college, six girls do. Yeah, if you had that awesome. kind of out of whack gender dis, dis, uh, discrimination the other way, we would never hear the end of it. Almost twice as many girls are going to college as boys, number one. And number two, I think here's a place where I think gender difference matters. Because when historically, when we've seen boys talking about this, they tend to be a little more flexible. They haven't been completely uh, sucked in by the emotional appeal of one side of these questions or another. Go back to the girls here for a second. Okay, so I want to give you a quote that was said by the founder of a really prominent institution in this country. I'm going to read you a quote and get your reaction, okay? We do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. This individual also once spoke at a KKK meeting. How do you feel about this quote? Um, I think there's no question how I should feel about the quote. <laughs> I think that's bad. That's just so obviously wrong. Um, I think that he shouldn't be a founder of any institution. I can't believe someone said that. He should be held accountable or she should be held accountable for what they said. He should probably be exposed for that. The worst part is there's several people who are currently in power that I can guess made that quote. So notice the last girl in the jean shorts, right? She knows exactly how she should respond. Her, her comment was, I know how I should respond to that statement. And then she turns around and says, I know some people currently in government today who feel the same way. So listen to what she said. She's pro I know not what I feel, not what I think. Here's how I should respond. Oh, and by the way, that response means I should, whoever said that, I also have to blame the Trump administration. Do you see that right there, that little, that little catch right there, catch and release uh, statement there? It tells you everything you want to know about these people. They have, they have their worldview handed to them. It's spoon fed to them. So typically, you know what's going to happen. When they find out it's, Margaret Sanger, it's Planned Parenthood, it's not Donald Trump or Pompeo or somebody like that. Watch all of a sudden how they pivot. They know how they're supposed to feel about Planned Parenthood. And the, we're supposed to feel that Planned Parenthood helps people, helps women. Never once, watch, not once will any of these girls mention the word abortion. Watch. The abortion rate for black women is five times higher than white women. Can an organization that says they support Black Lives Matter really say that if, you know, their founder, she said that their goal is to exterminate the Negro population? Someone else should step up to the plate who is more accepting and who resembles what Planned Parenthood says they stand for, which is lives. When you say that Planned Parenthood stands for lives, what do you mean by that? Like, they, they help women um, make their own decisions. As long as that the organization itself isn't being racist, then we can't really go after the organization itself for it. I still definitely support Planned Parenthood. I do think Planned Parenthood is important and needs to, like, continue on. Blue Jean Girl just really touches a nerve with me, right? She did it there again, right? That I still support plan. You just got through saying that these institutions held, had to be held accountable. And now, and the first young woman who said that not what Planned Parenthood stands for, she said, but what Planned Parenthood says they stand for. The, 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 the inability to conceive what you're saying, right? That she recognized, on some level, that one young woman recognized that what Planned Parenthood says they do and what they say they represent aren't the same things. Somebody has to step up to the plate, right? What do you, if, if this were any other organization or it was done by a conservative, you would be calling them the, for them to burn it down, all of it. There's no remediation, there's no way to fix this. The, the founder started, it re instituted racist institutions. You can hear what the founders of those institutions said. It has to be removed, except when Planned Parenthood is concerned.
it's time for some real education. Gilbert Keith Chesterton, a.k.a. G.K. Chesterton, was an English writer, philosopher, lay theologian, and literary and art critic. Born in 1874, he has been referred to as the Prince of Paradox. Chesterton created the fictional priest detective Father Brown and was a major figure in the movement of Christian apologetics. Even some who disagree with his faith have acknowledged the wide appeal of his books, Orthodoxy and The Everlasting Man. Chesterton routinely referred to himself as an Orthodox Christian and came to identify this position more and more with Catholicism, eventually converting to Catholicism from high church Anglicanism. Yep, G.K. Chesterton is indeed one of the towering figures of 20th century Christian apologetic, apologetics. As Crady pointed out, he was instrumental, in, his books were instrumental in helping Lewis, C.S. Lewis, find his way back to Christianity. And the title of one of his poems is called The Convert, because he, to himself, too, had to find his way back to what he considered to be orthodoxy, to come back to uh, the idea of what the fundamental faith was. And this poem is interesting. It's called The Convert. After one moment when I bowed my head, and the whole world turned over and came upright. I love that. He bowed his head, he got on his knees to be able to see the world aright. At, after one moment when I bowed my head, and the whole world turned over and came upright, and I came out where the old road shone white, I walked the ways and heard what all men said, forests of tongues like autumn leaves unshed, being not lo unlovable but strange and light, Old riddles and new creeds, not in despite, but softly, as men smile about the dead. Uh, everything for me, when I, when I bowed my head, when I turned myself from the modern world, looking supposedly backward, I had a glimpse into the future. And all those old creeds, those thousands of converts speaking in tongues, all of that argument and all of that philosophy and theology, suddenly, suddenly, it wasn't about the dead anymore. It was about the living. So from that first stanza to the second stanza, you see what this new knowledge has brought him. The sages have a hundred maps to give that trace their crawling cosmos like a tree. They rattle reason out through many a sieve that stores the sand and lets the gold go free. And all these things are less than dust to me because my name is Lazarus and I live. These rationalists now who have turned their back on the old road, the road that led back to Christ, which led forward to eternal salvation, they shift, shift like a sands through the hourglass. They sift their reason, but they've got it backwards. They leave the gold of Christ in the top half of the, of the shifter, and only the sand gets through to the bottom. They have lost everything by thinking they have found a rational world. And to me, it matters more than most, because I am Lazarus, who was dead and now live. All right, just as a reminder, these premier beverage vessels of freedom are now available when you join our Patriot Club with a one-time $99 tax-deductible donation. Your gift literally keeps this show going as Facebook and YouTube have demonetized our content. So please visit patriotclub.us, that's patriotclub.us, and help us keep growing this show. Now we're going to wrap things up as we usually do with our fun fact of the day. Margaret Sanger's mother was pregnant 18 times and had 11 children before she died of tuberculosis at the age of 50. And it's believed that Margaret wanted birth control because she thought all of the pregnancies for her mom is what actually caused the mom's death. Sigh, one of the seven wasn't Margaret. And that's going to be our show for today. For Freedom Project, I'm Duke, she's Katie. Until next time, stay educated, my friends.